All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Paul Roy, this is SOI 7 Ministry, and this is our weekly Shabbat message. So today's message is going to be on the removal, removing the three shepherds. And who in the world are the three shepherds, right? So uh, before I start jumping into that, let's pray and blow the shofar or the trumpet. I get to have fun on that thing. <laughs> I need to practice it a whole lot more so I can like do some really cool stuff on it or something. I don't know. <laughs> Babe, would you would you put the scriptures in as I give uh, James a break? <laughs> he's always the scripture man on Shabbat. Unless he's preaching, then somebody else. All right. So, removing the three shepherds. When I, I, I have been working on this for probably, well, in my mind, <laughs> I have been meditating on it and mulling over it and chewing on it and reading it again and again and again. And, and as I read this chapter of what this is all based off of Zechariah 11, okay? Zechariah 11 and everything that's coming off of this, we're going to do a breakdown of this whole chapter of what it explains. And in it, it talks about the these three shepherds. So, and, I, and you know, you've as always, you've read certain things again and again. Zechariah is a major end time prophecy book, especially many of the last chapters in it, as well as like Ezekiel and Isaiah or Ezekiel and Daniel. You know, major ones. And so, I've read this so many times, and then I read it, and it's like. What in the who are the three shepherds? Yah removes these three shepherds, and so, um, so I went and after chewing on it for a minute, trying to figure it out, I couldn't figure out all of it, and I so I went to my brothers and everybody uh, in the ministry. You know, like Proverbs says, uh, through much counsel comes uh, uh, wisdom, and so I thought, well. I went to them. I said, I'm going to, I'm seeking counsel from my brethren. Help me figure this out. And so we talked about it and we went over stuff and it was the, the last thing I needed to understand for the rest of it to fall into place. I hope by the grace of Yah. So, uh, so I think that we as brethren and as a council, hopefully came up with some wisdom here and, um, we figured out what this is and it's just, it's another amazing layout before us of exactly what Yah's doing. And he so much of it, he puts it just into one chapter, even though he continues on. And it, you just end up seeing how, man, Yah just keeps telling us the same story again and again and again and again through every one of his prophets and, and his people, his disciples and stuff like this. And th there really is no excuse for us not to understand and know. There really isn't. Because if you, if you really do read the Bible from front to back, you don't skip any books. You don't skip anything because you have been taught it's irrelevant or, or any whatever reason. I met a pastor one time, became good friends, and and um, uh, him and I started talking about end time prophecy one time, and he looked at me like a deer in the headlights. And I finally looked at him, I said, you know what I'm talking about? And he goes, I have no idea. And I, I'm like, what do you mean? And he goes, because um, I was quote, quoting Revelation among other places, and he said, I have never, ever read the book of Revelation. I won't read it. I was dumbfounded. And so what I'm saying is, is we don't have an excuse for not knowing what's happening. His word just keeps telling us this amazing, beautiful story again and again. Amen. 
Um, so back to the beginning, um, let's pray. And then let's start with Zechariah chapter 11. Father, we just come to you in prayer right now in the name of Yeshua. I am so excited about this message and Abba, please let your words and your words alone be spoken. Let nothing false come from my lips. Let no false understanding be spoken. Um, if anything, if I have any misunderstanding, if I have any false information, what I think I understand about what I'm about to preach on, Father, then don't let me speak on it. I, I, I plead with you. I only want your truth and your truth alone to come out, Father, and to show us and to reveal to us just the amazing ability that you that you reveal in all of your work and all of your plan that you lay out before us and everything that you have done long before you even began the foundation of the earth and give and everything that that has been before the foundation of the earth including the death and resurrection and everything of our messiah yeshua and so father we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to dig into the word and may it fill us with the meat of your word to grow and to grow stronger in you to grow sharper in you to be more aware so that we are not caught naked as scripture says, as Yeshua says, and even in Revelation, I think, 19. Be aware lest you be found naked. Let us not be found naked, Father. But let us be found in our robes, ready before you in Yeshua's name. And so we praise you and we thank you. May every one of us have ears to hear and a heart that is receptive. What your Holy Spirit teaches, we ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. First of all, let's go to Zechariah chapter 11, and we're going to read that in its entirety. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen. Because the mighty trees are ruined, wail, O oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has come down. There is the sound of wailing shepherds, for their glory is in ruins. There is the sound of roaring lions, for the pride of the Jordan is in ruins. Thus says Yehovah my Elohim, feed the flock for slaughter, whose owners slaughtered them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say, Blessed be Yehovah, for I am rich, and their shepherds do not pity them. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says Yehovah. But indeed I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. They shall attack the land, and I will not deliver them from their hand. For I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs, the one I called beauty, and the other I called bonds. I fed the flock. I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. Okay, so real quick, it was like, when I read that, and, and you know, that same old thing, you read something again and again and again, and it just doesn't click. And that was what really caught my attention when going through this uh wait whoa in one month you got rid of the three shepherds what three shepherds who are these three shepherds and, and you immediately start imagining okay what kind of people could these be and, and you start running through the prophets and you know different people who who per could portray that right amen and so um let me let me go ahead and continue before I get off on that. All right, sorry. Um, I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die, and what is perishing perish. Let those that are left 
eat each other's flesh. And I took my staff beauty and cut it in two, that I might break the covenant which I had made with all the peoples. So it was broken with all the peoples. I'm sorry. So it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of Jehovah. Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages thirty pieces of silver. And Jehovah said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the thirty pieces of silver and threw them into the house of Jehovah for the potter. Then I cut into my other staff, bonds, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And the Lord said to me, Next, take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. For indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that still stand. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Um, Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. So as you can tell, reading this chapter, there is so much in there between, you know, First of all, why does it start off with the description of Lebanon? This is all about uh, Israel, right? So why the description of, of Lebanon that fire may devour your cedars and well, O Cyprus? <coughs> uh, for the cedar has fallen because the mighty trees are ruined, well, O oaks of Bashan. So that was the first process of, of what led to this. What what I, I read this, and then I read it again, I read it again. I'm like, man, there's a ton of stuff in here. What is going on? What does this mean? And, and the beginning was what was dumbfounding at first. It's like trying to understand. And then verse 3, there is the sound of wailing shepherds, for their glory is in ruins. There is the sound of roaring lions, for the pride of the Jordan is in ruin. So, first we have to understand these first three verses, right? So, the first thing we do, let's break down verses 1 through 3. Let's try to understand. When you look at the cedars, okay, or Lebanon, first we want to go to... Uh, Let's go to 1 Kings. Let's go to 1 Kings first. <laughs> you know, I always love being able to preach the word because I believe without a doubt, it's a privilege. It really is. But I love it when a message just gets me excited like a kid, you know what I'm saying? And you just like you're looking for that that really good piece of chocolate way back in the cookie jar kind of thing. And and you know what is it, babe? You always love to quote all the time, uh, Proverbs twenty nine two, I think it is, or or twenty five two, um, to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out, right? So, you know, it's, but he also says, unless you come unto him like a child, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And when you get into these kind of messages, it just, it stirs you like that, it, that childlike excitement, because it's like, wow, Yah is just showing us amazing little treasures. And, and nuggets of different things of how how cohesive the his word is 
how how glue. I mean, you can't you can't fault it in any way, shape, or form. You you can't do nothing to it. It just every time you think for those who would have the 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 unfortunate fortitude to try to prove it wrong. They always fail. Truth always wins out. Amen. All right. So what is Lebanon? First Kings chapter five, verses seven through 10. So it was when Haram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, blessed be Yehovah this day. For he has given David a wise son over this great people. Then Haram sent to Solomon saying, I have considered the message which you sent me and I will do all you desire concerning the cedar and cypress logs. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon to the sea. I will float them in rafts by sea to the place you indicated to me and will have them broken apart there. Then you can take them away and you shall fulfill my desire by giving food for my household. Then Haram gave Solomon cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. So, okay, what's the point of these scriptures? Lebanon was known for the cedar and cypress. The cedar and cypress trees were a huge part of the building of the house of Yehovah, among so many other things. And not only that, but on, on a spiritual symbolic level, cedars and oaks, but the oaks of Bashan, as we're going to get into, symbolize pride and loftiness. Loftiness is to exalt, to lift up, right? All right, so, but before, let's read it. But also, let's read Hosea 14. Sorry, Hosea 14, 5 through 7. Okay, stop hiding. Isaiah 14, 5 through 7. I will be like the dew to Yisrael. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree. His fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain, grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. So, you know, Lebanon was, is, is described in so many ways in scripture of being, uh, of beauty, of loftiness, exalting these great, the greatest trees uh, besides Bashan, the greatest trees that would be brought to Israel. And now when we get into the same thing, uh, Bashan, which is located in Syria, um, is also known as part of the three um, sections of what they called um, um, Palestine, but this was the far northern part. And Bashan, the first mention of Bashan is in Numbers chapter 21, verse 33. And you guys are all be familiar with this, I'm sure. 2133. And they turned and went up to the way to Bashan. So Og, king of Bashan, went out against them and he and all his people to battle at Edre. So they went to battle Israel. This is Og of Bashan. This is one of the, the Nephilim. His, his, his bed was 14 feet long and 9 feet wide. So this is a big dude. <laughs> so, but it's the first mention. Bashan is always known in scripture as being a, a great and mighty place, a mighty fort, uh, forest. 
and and the oak trees. And as we all know, oak is one of the most strongest woods in the world. I mean, it's so condensed and so solid. And these trees were trees that were, uh, they even had moved some to Israel. And I mean, these trees live for ever. <laughs> I mean, they really live a long time. All right. Um, and then the other verse for Bashan is Isaiah 2. And I like how this, what this does, this brings the, I think the spiritual understanding on, on it and the, the figurative, um, use of its physical uh, strength it gives us um, the other all right Isaiah chapter 2 verses 12 and 13 for the day of Yehovah's veil shall come upon everything proud and lofty upon everything lifted up and it shall be brought low upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up and upon all the oaks of Bashan upon I'm going to read verse 14 also upon all the high mountains, upon all the high, all the hills that are lifted up. Now, I, I, there's a specific reason why I wanted you to get that last verse in there. That Remember this, high mountains, high hills, all of that, okay? So these first two verses, is Yah is telling us the very strength. It's almost like this was known as the strength of the Middle East in, in, in its beauty and the trees and just the, the natural power of what Yah blessed in the land of Lebanon, in the land of Bashan, which we know now to be Syria. Now, all of Syria was Bashan. Bashan was inside what we know now to be Syria. Okay. Um, so we, we get this understanding. So let's go back to Zechariah uh, 11 for a minute and go back and forth with this as we dissect this. Okay, so open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen because the mighty trees are ruined. Wail, O oaks of Bashan. All right. Now, what is one of the key things to understand about this? They are judged in the last days, Lebanon and Syria, okay? They are a part of the nations that rise up against Israel in the last days. They, they are a part of the nations that have always been a pain in their rear end, so to speak, uh, coming against Israel all the time. You know, we've even seen it just in between 20, or I'm sorry, between 2000, 2010, there was the war against Lebanon and um, Israel took their tanks and rolled right on up all the way into the capital and just pretty much told them, go home and sit down or we'll blow you up. And then they went home and Lebanon went and sat down and left them alone. And, you know, but they've always, you know, they're always speaking stuff and they've been caught with helping you know, um, Iran and, and helping um, um, anybody against Israel, right? So uh, I think what, Al-Qaeda comes out of Lebanon or something like that, or one of the terrorist groups, something like that. But regardless, the point is, is so God had blessed these, these nations and these nations were used at the time to bring the greatest trees to build the very first temple of Yehovah. And, and so, I mean, by their wickedness and stuff, they, they curse their land and their pride and loftiness as, as it describes. So we have the understanding of what this is. Okay. Verse three, there is the sound of wailing shepherds for their glory is in ruins. There is the sound of roaring lions or the pride of the Jordan is in ruins. I will get ahead of myself. This verse needs to be explained after we get to the three shepherds, when we get to the part where he says he will remove the three shepherds in one month. So we're going to save that. It's going to make sense later. All right. <clears throat> so this, uh, verses four through six. Now, this is a key. This is basically, uh, it's one of the many times in scripture where it gives us like a whole picture 
of the constant disobedience and and the back and forth that Israel did with Yah and his continual mercy and stuff. And so I'm going to read this section um, in, in Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah uh, chapter 2. And so we're going to read this section to get this whole picture so that the rest of what is explained shows the whole thing of what is being laid out, the whole plan of Yehovah just in this one chapter, yet the prior chapters and the following chapters end up saying the same thing in just different ways. And it goes to, to, to me, one of the things as I was finishing this up, going over everything this morning and just making sure that I, it's like, okay, Abba, am I, am I, do I have this right? Do I understand this right? Yah's wisdom and intelligence, I, I, it feels like those words don't even do justice to his smarts. You know, like scripture says, his, great, his foolishness is greater than our wisdom. His weaknesses are greater than our, strength, our strongest strengths. You know, he, there's just, there is no comparison. And yet, he has managed to put words together through his people that can cover such a multitude of stuff like the Lord's Prayer. When you think about the breakdown from our Father who art in heaven to um, deliver us from the evil one, amen. Everything in between literally covers his whole plan. Our Father who's in, who's in heaven, this is where it starts. It is hallowed and perfect. I am the one that gives you your daily bread. I am the one that keeps you and delivers you from sin as you forgive others. I am the one that leads you away from temptation and delivers you from the evil one. It's the whole thing of salvation, the whole picture. And this is what he does in his word again and again and again for us to absorb. We have no excuse. So Jeremiah chapter 2. Yes. Um, starting at verse 23 to chapter 5, verse 19. All right, take a drink of water. Here we go. Okay. How can you say I am not polluted? <laughs> How can you say? I am not polluted. I have not gone after the bales. See your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You are a swift drum, uh, dromedary, breaking loose in her ways. A wild donkey used, uh, used to the wilderness that sniffs at the wind in her desire, in her time of mating. Who can turn her away? All those who seek her will not weary themselves. In her month, they will find her. Withhold your foot from being unshod and your throat from thirst. But you said, there is no hope. No, for I have loved aliens and after them I will go. As the thief is ashamed when he is found out, so is the house of Israel ashamed. In other words, they aren't. <laughs> They and their kings and their princes and their priests and their prophets saying to a tree, you are my father and to a stone you gave birth to me for they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, arise and save us. But where are your gods that you have made for yourselves? Let them arise if they can save you in the time of your trouble, for according to the number of your cities are your gods, O Yehuda. Why will you plead with me? You all, you all have transgressed against me, says Yehovah. In vain I have ch chastened your children. They received no correction. Your sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. What does it say in verse 3? Uh, how the 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 roaring lions for for uh, 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 that Jordan is in ruins. This is part of what that's talking about. Your sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. 
O generation, see the word of Yehovah. Have I been a wilderness to Yisrael or a land of darkness? Why do my people say we are lords? We will come no more to you. Can a virgin forget her ornament or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Why do you beautify your way to seek love? Therefore you have also taught the wicked woman, are the wicked women your ways? Also on your skirts is found the blood of the lives of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but plainly on all these things. Yet you say, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead my case against you, because you say, I have not sinned. Why do you gad about <clears throat> so much to change your way? Also, you shall be ashamed of Mitzrayim, Egypt, as you were ashamed of Assyria. Indeed, you will go forth from him from, uh, with your hands on your head. That sounds like being taken into captivity. For Yehovah has rejected your trusted allies, and you will not prosper by them. They say, if a man divorces his wife, and she goes from him, and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says Yehovah. There he, he's still pleading with her, come back to me. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see, where have you not lain with men? By the road you have sat for them, like an Arabian in the wilderness, and you have polluted the land with your harlot trees and your wickedness. Mishpaha, that, that is a practice that still happens to this day in Europe. There are prostitutes because it's a it's a real weird way of the legalities of prostitution. Some it's legal, but you can't do this or whatever, right? Um, so women will sit on a chair on the side of the road and just sit there, all decked out, and that is how they get picked up. It could be, you could be driving all throughout the country roads, all throughout Italy. That's where we saw it. it. was there. We were, Michelle and I were going, we were just taking all these different roads and just going all over the place. And that one, multiple times when we go on, I guess, certain roads, I don't know if it's certain areas that it was more common in, but it, you would expect to see this in a, downtown slum area but we saw it on the side of the road it the beautiful vineyards and all these gorgeous villas and everything and here's a prostitute sitting in a chair right there and you know she is the way she's dressed and everything there's no question about it of course we found out the information too but yeah this this right there what scripture talks about still to this day it's just crazy. <clears throat> All right, verse three, therefore the showers have been withheld. And if anybody doesn't know where we're at, we're in Jeremiah chapter three, verse three. Therefore the showers have been withheld and there has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead. You refuse to be ashamed. Will you not from this time cry to me, my father, you are the guide of my youth. Will he remain angry forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, you have spoken and done evil things as you were able. Yehovah said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Yisrael has done? She has gone up on every... Now, this is what I wanted you to catch on. Um, is it in Hosea? I said to remember that part uh, talks about, I read it on the high heels and everything. Um, have you seen what backsliding Israel done? She has gone up on every high mountain and on under every green tree and there played the harlot. I said, after she had done all these things, return to me, but she did not return. And her treacherous 
sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet for all this, her treachery, treacherous sister Judah has not returned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says Yehovah. Then Yehovah said to me, Backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, backsliding Israel, says Yehovah. I will not cause my anger to fall on you. For I am merciful, says Yehovah. I will not remain angry forever. Now remember, this is talking to the northern ten tribes, the house of Ephraim, right? And and this is important because we're as we get into the, the the stick of beauty and the stick of bond. We're gonna be it's gonna we're gonna be touching on that uh in that chapter eleven of Zechariah. So uh, continuing on, um Return, backsliding Israel, says Yehovah, I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says Yehovah, I will not remain angry forever. Verse 13, only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against Yehovah your Elohim, and have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, says Yehovah. Return, O backsliding children, says Yehovah, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city, two from a family, and will bring you to Zion. I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Then it shall come to pass, <clears throat> when you are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says Yehovah that they will say no more, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made any more. At that time, Jerusalem shall be called the throne of Yehovah, and all the nations shall be gathered to it, to the name of Yehovah, to Yerushalayim. No more shall they follow the dictates of their evil hearts. So we know what this is talking about. As I said, breaking down Zechariah 11, it's got its own things in there for us to seek and dig and, and understand. And yet, the very thing I described of how it's describing the whole story, yet we have the same thing being described right here to the very end. This is, this is referencing entering into millennial reign, when no more anyone will follow the dictates of their own heart. And it says that he will have shepherds after their own heart. Well, those who rule and reign with Yeshua in millennial reign will be those shepherds after his own heart. Kings and priests, as scripture says. Amen. All right. So continuing on. Um, eight. Let me read 18 again, I think. In those days, uh, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. Okay, right. So Israel restored back together as one. And they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given as an inheritance to your fathers. But I said, how can I put you among the children <coughs> and give you a pleasant land? Okay, verse 19. But I said, how can I put you among the children and give you a pleasant land? A beautiful heritage of the host of nations. He's like, how can I do this? How can I put you among them? And I said, you shall call me my father, and not turn away from me. Surely as a wife <coughs> treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says Jehovah. A voice was heard on the desolate heights, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way, they have forgotten the Lord their God. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Indeed, we do come to you, for you are Yehovah our El. Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. 
truly in Yehovah our El is the salvation of, yes, of Yisrael. For shame has devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame and our reproach covers us for we have sinned against the Lord our God. And uh, we and our fathers from our youth, even to this day, and have not obeyed the voice of Yehovah our El. If you will return, O Yisrael, says Yehovah, return to me. If you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. You shall swear, O Yehovah lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. Ms. Baha'i, Yah shows us even right here that if Israel would do her job that she was created to do, all the nations of the earth would be blessed by it. This whole world, I, I, could you imagine 8 billion people on this world blessed by Yah because the one he chose to be kings and priests to the nations, if they had obeyed. They had obeyed. And if we would obey and walk in righteousness unto him, then our families will be blessed by us. People who are interacted with us, yeah, he says, all that you put your hands to do, I will bless. So if you put your hands to help others, they will be blessed. This is it's powerful. All right, we're in Jeremiah 4, verse 3. For thus says Yehovah to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground. Do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to Yehovah. Take away the foreskins of your hearts. You men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, blow the trumpet in the land, cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves. Let us go into the fortified cities, set up the standard towards Zion. Take refuge, do not delay, for I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. The lion has come up from his thicket. The destroyer of nations is on his way. Well, we know who that is. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. For this, clothe, clothe yourself with sackcloth, lament and wail. For the fierce anger of Yehovah has not turned back from us. It shall come to pass in that day, says Yehovah, that the heart of the king shall perish. And the heart of the princes, the priests shall be astonished and the prophets shall wander. Man, <laughs> then I said, ah, Yehovah Elohim. Surely you have greatly deceived this people and Jerusalem, saying you shall have peace where the sword reaches to the whereas the sword reaches to the heart. At that time it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of the desolate heights blows in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan or to cleanse. A wind too strong for these will come for me. Now I will also speak judgment against them. Behold, he shall come up like clouds, his chariots like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness, that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make mention to the nations, yes, proclaim against Jerusalem, 
that watchers come from a far country and raise their voice against the cities of Yehuda. Like keepers of a field, they are against her all around. Because she has been rebellious against me, says Yehovah, your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. This is your wickedness, because it is bitter, because it reaches to your heart. O oh, my soul, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace. Because you have heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war, destruction upon destruction is cried. <sighs> For the whole land is plundered. Suddenly my tents are plundered, my curtains in a moment. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people are foolish. They have not known me. They are silly children. They have no understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good, they have no knowledge. <sighs> man, it's like a punch in the gut, man. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. The heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled. All the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man. All the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness. All its cities were broken down at the presence of Yehovah by his fierce anger. For thus says Yehovah, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. For this shall the earth mourn, the heavens above be black, because I have spoken, I have purposed and will not relent. Nor will I turn back from it. The whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and, and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken. Not a man shall dwell in it. When you are plundered, what will you do? Though you clothe yourself with crimson, though you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you will make yourselves fair. Your lovers will despise you. They will seek your life. For I have heard a voice as of a woman in labor, the anguish as of her who brings forth her first child, the voice of the daughter of Zion bewailing herself. She spreads her hands saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murderers. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know, seek in her open places if you can find a man, if there is anyone who, can exe who executes judgment, who seeks the truth. I will pardon her, though they say, as Yehovah lives, surely they swear falsely. O Yehovah, are not your eyes on the truth? You have stricken them, but they have not grieved. You have consumed them but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to return. Therefore I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish, for they do not know the way of Yehovah. The judge of their El, I will go to the great men and speak to them, for they have known the ways of Yehovah, the judgment of their El. But these have altogether broken the yoke. Burst the bonds, therefore a lion from the forest shall slay them, a wolf of the desert shall destroy them, a leopard will watch over their cities, everyone who goes out from there shall be torn in pieces, because their transgressions are many, their backslidings have increased, 
How shall I pardon you for this? Your children have forsaken me and sworn by those that are not gods. When I had fed them to the full, then they committed adultery, assembled themselves by troops in the harlots' houses. They were, le- they were like well-fed, lusty stallions. Every one neighed at his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things, says Jehovah? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? Go up on her walls and destroy, but do not make a complete end. Take away her branches, for they are not Jehovah's. Ooh, man. For the house of Yisrael and the house of Yehuda have dealt very treacherously with me, says the Lord. They have lied about Jehovah and said, It is not he. Neither will evil come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. The prophets become wind, for the word is not in them. Thus shall it be done to them. Therefore, thus says Yehovah Elohim Tzveot, because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people wood and it shall devour them. Behold, I will bring a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, says Jehovah. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Their quiver is like an open tomb. They are all mighty men. They shall eat your Eat up your harvest and your bread, which your sons and daughters should eat. They shall eat up your flocks and your herds. They shall eat up your vines and your fig trees. They shall destroy your fortified cities, in which you trust with the sword. Nevertheless, in those days, says Jehovah, I will not make a complete end of you. It will be when you say, why does Jehovah R. L. do all these things to us? Then you shall answer them, just as you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so shall you serve aliens in a land that is not yours. I weep for two reasons. One is because of the wickedness and all that they failed Yehovah to do before him. And what they are supposed what they were supposed to be for all the world. But I weep tears of sad joy. It's an oxymoron. Because I'm sad that Yah had to come to this point to show this mercy. But I weep with joy because in all of this, man, you just read this, what we just read of everything that Yah did. And he still said, yet I will not make an end. And I'm still, I'm still going to deliver you because I love you. Because Yah loves you more. <laughs> because Yah loves you more. Okay. So. Going back to Zechariah 11. Verses 7 through 9. Let's pick up on the next part. So it says, so I, so I fed the flock. Now, with verses four, let me re- back up real quick. So verses four through six, we read th- th- that big section of Jeremiah 2 through Jeremiah 5. And, and to reiterate on that, he said, thus says the Lord my God, feed the flocks for slaughter. So he continued to hand them over unto their enemies. 
that was to feed the flocks, my flocks, for slaughter, whose owners slaughtered them and feel no guilt. Who are these owners? Thank you, babe. <clears throat> Who are these owners, right? And we're going to get to that in a minute. But these owners have no guilt, and they even have the gall to say, Blessed be Yehovah, for I am rich. And their shepherds do not pity them, for I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land. Yah had no mercy because of the sin of the shepherds, the, the of the people who watched over them, right? Those who were appointed to feed the flock. Who are the three shepherds removed? Who was appointed to feed the flock? But indeed, I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king. They shall attack the land. I will not deliver them from their hand. And that's exactly what Yah did all the way up until destroyed in 70 AD. And for the next 1800 years, Israel didn't exist. He would not deliver them back into the land. All right, so just wanted to recap that, and that's where we get the whole understanding of Jeremiah 2, 23 through 5, 19. So 7, 8, and 9. Um, so I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock. I took for myself two staffs. The one I called beauty, the other I called bonds. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, and I fed the flock. I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die, what is perishing perish. Let those that are left eat each other's flesh. Okay, so there, if, if I understand this right, if Yah has blessed me to understand these three scriptures right, First of all, so what are the three shepherds that, okay, huh, oh my goodness. No, not first of all. So so I fed the flock for slaughter, okay? That was a reiteration of I handed them to their enemies, okay? They didn't obey. She kept playing the harlot, all that stuff. So that's what I did, all right? I, um, I took for myself two staffs. The one I call beauty, the other I call bonds. Now, I'm going to break that down on the next verses after this, but for the sake of argument, that is Israel and Judah, okay? This is the two houses of Israel, and I'll explain it. Then he says, um, I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. So I, I, I broke this stick in half, and... Also, it concludes of the divorce from Israel. This is that divorce, okay? The northern Israel, the northern tribes, ten northern tribes, Israel. He divorced them, as we just read in Jeremiah two through two, chapter two, twenty three through five nineteen. In there, he said, "I gave you a certificate of divorce," and, and then he started talking about them two different ways: Ephraim or uh, uh, Israel and Judah. All right, and then. So who are the three shepherds that he dismisses in one month because his soul loathed them and their soul abhorred him? Who are those three shepherds? Who are those three shepherds? So who are the people that Yehovah ultimately appointed over Yisrael? The first was the prophet. The prophet. Moses was the beginning of that. He, like it says, I will raise a prophet like unto Moses. The prophets mishpaha under the title prophet. The prophets were to lead Israel and all people in the word of Yah by telling them the things to be done, things this, whatever. They were to lead them, to show them what to do or how to repent or whatever, right? In certain things. Then next. What came next? Okay, so first came the prophet, then came the priest at Mount Sinai, then the Levitical priesthood came with the high priest. The priesthood were supposed to be shepherds 
just like the prophet was to be a shepherd over the people. The prophets failed. The priests failed. And then the third didn't happen until King Saul, the king, the three shepherds, the prophet, the priest, and the king. These were to be the shepherds over Israel. The king was to lead Israel in all the ways. This is why David could do sacrifices like the priest because he was a shepherd over the people just like the priests were a shepherd, just like the prophets were a shepherd. And in one month, he removed the three shepherds. That dumbfounded me. I'm like, well, what, what in one month? How did this happen in, in one month? And I'm racking my brain on all Israel history and the history of the world of anything that I know. And I'm like, Anything that give that indication and only one thing came to mind. All right, am I getting ahead of myself? Um, okay, so do I want to touch on that part yet? Okay. Um, yes, okay, I'm going to do it. All right, so. Yeshua, what happened when Yeshua fulfilled his death and resurrection and his ascension? What happened? He became the final high priest. He became the prophet like unto Moses. He became king of kings. At that time, this in that month, in one month, if I'm if I if Yah gave me this understanding, the month of Aviv, in the year that Yeshua's death and resurrection, he became the Pesach lamb, and the resurrection, the first fruits of the uh, of of the resurrection of the flesh, and all these things, and he became the high priest. That's why he said, "Don't touch me, for I go to present myself before the Father." Because he became the high priest to go pre present the, the sheaf offering, the first fruits offering. And he became king of kings and lord of lords. Because he is the king of the Jews, as was written over his head when he was crucified. He is it. And this was when, I believe, by scripture, was when the three prophets, or the three shepherds were removed. The prophets, the kings, and the priests. And since then, as far as I understand, there have never been prophets, kings, or priests in the land of Israel. They were removed because Yeshua became the final prophet, the final king, and the final priest of Israel. So, if I'm right in this understanding, those were the three shepherds removed. And why and when? Okay, so let's get a little deeper into this. So verses 10 through 12. And I look, I'm sorry, and I took my staff beauty and cut it in two that I might break the covenant which I had made with all the peoples. So it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of Yehovah. Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, Give me my wages, if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Woo, is that cool or what? So at first this really threw me off because I thought I understood the, the, the stick of beauty and bonds is the two houses of Israel. But then, wait, he took the stick of beauty and broke that one in two. And I'm like, I don't understand. What does that mean? But then. Hopefully, if Yah gave me the understanding on this, which I believe he did, it says, I broke the covenant. And I thought, well, wait a minute, what covenant? He didn't break the covenant at Mount Sinai. That covenant is what Hebrews talks about 
they were given the gospel as we are. So that covenant's not broken. Yeshua came to restore that covenant. So what covenant was broken? First marriage covenant. He broke the covenant with the one he divorced. Beauty, the, the staff of beauty, the northern tribes, he broke the covenant because that's who he divorced. What is the staff of beauty in the Hebrew? Noam. And it means favor, pleasantness, kindness, and mercy. Is that not what he showed Ephraim? He divorced her, but it goes further. So Yeshua had to die to renew this. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. This is why he broke this covenant. He broke the staff. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies, he who took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before Yehovah, and you shall not bring sin on the land which Yehovah your El is giving you as an inheritance. So, how in the world can that happen? Let's jump forward to Romans chapter 7. Verses 1 through 3. Or do you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, that covenant, so that she is no adulteress though she has married another man. So what is this? So what is that? He broke the stick. He says that I might break the covenant, which I had made with all the peoples. That's exactly what that is. That's that marriage covenant. And he broke this by his death. His death, the first husband has to die for her to be released. And so he did. And he broke that covenant with Ephraim so that he can bring her back into the fold. All right. So let's go to verses 13 and 14. Oh, and, and to continue verse 12, then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages. If not, um, refrain. So they weighed out 30 pieces of silver. So 13 and 14 needs to go with this to explain this. And the and Yehovah said to them, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver, threw them into the house of Yehovah for the potter. Then I cut into my other staff bonds that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So what does that mean? Why did we break the stick of bonds? The bonds is Judah. Judah was promised to always be kept a remnant in the land because they are the keepers of the law. So what was this brotherhood that had to be broken? All right, so the staff of bond, it is the word chavel. It means cord or rope. What has tied them down? Their bondage. He's breaking the bondage upon Judah, the territory and the region 
And the more accurate Hebrew definition is severity for the staff called bonds. It's severity. It, it's, uh, but here's the biggest thing. The staff, that mean, it means pains of travail and sorrows. Pains of travail and sorrows. Judah must go through this to be broken. To break her following after the older sister in all her ways. To break that brotherhood. So she has been veiled to not see the truth. While the kindness and favor has been shown unto Ephraim. To see the truth. To be restored because she's been released from that first covenant of marriage. It's awesome. Wow. <laughs> it just blows your mind, right? So, what, and, and so let's take this and let's go to Matthew chapter 27 and see the whole thing here. Matthew 27, verses 3 through 10. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple. What does it say, Jeremiah? They were thrown into the house of Jehovah and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the, the silver. It is not lawful to put them into treasury because they are price of blood. They consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers and therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. It is the very prophecy in Jeremiah. And it says, verse 9, Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, And they took the 30 pieces of silver of the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field as Yehovah directed me. It was 30 pieces of silver. And this is why we know that the, sti the stick of bonds or a beauty being broken was to break the marriage covenant. And the 30 pieces of silver, what's the point of that? Except it was for the price of his life. Yes, that's what he paid to get his harlot back. Hosea paid 17 pieces of silver to get his wife back before she was put to death. That representation. Yeah, an overpayment. Amen. <laughs> okay, so he does all of that. And what ultimately is has to happen for this fulfillment to be completed so that the two houses are restored as one. We go back to Zechariah 11, verses 15 through 17. Yehovah said to me, Next, take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. For indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek young, nor heal those that are broken, nor seek those that still stand. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear the hooves in pieces. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm, against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither. His right eye shall be totally blinded. Who is this? It is the Antichrist. And we know this when we look in, let's go to Daniel 11.
Daniel 11, starting from Starting at verse 29 to the end of the chapter, it shows you what he does, how he treats the Holy Covenant, and all of these things that he does. He has, he says that he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And it, and it even describes that he serves a God that, not, that his fathers don't know. And all of this, and that's what he's saying. He brings a language that, that you will not know. And so, so this is the Antichrist. This is the Anti-Messiah. And he will come and he will do these, this take over Jerusalem and, and Israel and all the things that happen. And the other confirmation to this is, um, I just had a brain pause. Oh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Verse 3 on says, and in the great falling away and the son of perdition is revealed, he will see himself in the, on, the, on the throne of God, uh, in the temple of God, and declare himself to be God. Um, he puts an end to sacrifice and offering all of this stuff. Because why? Because he does not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal the broken nor feed those that still stand. He will eat the flesh of the fat. He will just, he will take care of himself and he will ruin them all. That's his whole thing. And because he is a worthless shepherd, his right arm will wither completely and his right eye will be totally blinded and he will be destroyed. And so the finality in all of this, Mishpaha, is Zechariah chapter 12, the next chapter, verses 1 through 10. The burden of the word of Yehovah against Yisrael. Thus says Yehovah, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Yerushalayim a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. It shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces. Though all nations of the earth are gathered against it, in that day, says Yehovah, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, see right there, the right arm of the shepherd will wither completely and its right eye will be blinded. This is its army. And what is it saying? I will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. The governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength. In Yehovah's veil, their El. In that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the wood pile, like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. Yerushalayim. Yehovah will save the tents of Yehuda first. So that the glory. What did he say? I come for the Jew first. So that the glory of the house of David. And the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day, Yehovah will defend the inhabitants of Yerushalayim. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David. And the house of David shall be like Elohim, like Hamalak Yehovah. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Before them, it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against 
Jerusalem. And you can read that in Zechariah 14, verses 9 to 15. Hallelujah, Mishpacha. Hallelujah. This, this whole picture, this whole, another amazing way that Yah reveals to us and teaches us. He showed us that he had created three shepherds and who they were and removed them in one month through his death and resurrection and ascension. Because he became king of kings, lord of lords. He became the final high priest. He became the ultimate prophet of all. Because he is the son of Elohim. The son of our father in heaven. Our Messiah, Yeshua. Our bridegroom that we await to return. Bo, Yeshua, Bo. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.